All right, welcome to our Shop Night Live. Man, it feels like it's been a long time, but it's only been one week, one week since uh, last Thursday night, and it's great to have you hanging out with me tonight. Just make yourself comfortable right over there in the shop. But uh, we just finished last night our course on the Contemporary Roundtable, this little baby right here. Check that out. The ebony base and the sunburst mahogany top with the ebony line. So it was a, it ended up being a little bit of a late night, but lots of fun. We ended up with more video and an extra session than we expected because there were a lot of alter, alternate tips and techniques in there. And if you feel like you missed out, you did not miss out. It's never too late around here to take a course because they are now in video format where you can just take part in it and you'll be able to go along at your leisure and get the full size drawings if you're interested in that course. But if you did miss that and you really want to be part of a live course, you're in luck because we're about to start a new one. A week from Saturday, we're starting the Modern Writing Desk. And I'm excited for that one because I designed that desk. And it's, it was like the old days with the furniture masters of having some fun designing a contemporary piece of furniture. So I'm going to show you step by step how to design something, or well, how to make something, and the process I went through in thinking about it all along the way. And we will build this modern writing desk if you want to be a part of that. It's scheduled for seven sessions. We'll meet on Tuesday and Saturday. Tuesday evenings and Saturday morning, Eastern Time. And then it may go an extra. I don't know. I'm hoping I can get it all done in seven sessions, but we'll see. And then the following month, we have the Shaker style chest of drawers, which is scheduled for eight weeks. So a couple great courses coming up, and I hope you'll be a part of it. But tonight, I'm excited to share with you a cool little technique that I just finally cracked the code on, okay? It was something I'd been thinking about for a while, and it is a method for making an octagonal piece like this on the table saw without any math. And just, I'm, I'm thinking it would make a nice trivet, like, you know, to support the hot, like a hot plate. Um, what else could we do with this? We could, it could be a coaster for your, your big mug, right? <laughs> your really big mug. <laughs> and uh, it could be a pedestal for a vase or a vase. The vase sounds much more important. And maybe that uh, fourth grade trophy you have, you could throw right on there. All good. Now, I didn't put any finish on this yet, but it's, uh, this is a piece of cherry. And... It's an octagonal meeting that we've got. It's eight inches across, and it starts out as a square. And then we just clip off the corners at 45 degrees, and so that each one of these lengths is equal, or at least to the eye, right? And then I'll bevel these here. Now, I set out tonight, I was going to think about I already had it written up and everything. I was getting ready to sh have an evening about chamfers or chamfers. Who says chamfers? I, I think that's more of a European thing. But um, chamfers, which is just a, a cut corner or 45 degree um, bevel cut along a corner. And it, it can really be more than different than 45, but uh, it's used a lot. A chamfer is used a lot to create a really nice refinement and detail to a piece of furniture without a lot of effort. So if you think of a pencil post bed, that's essentially four corners chamfered on a long taper, right? And uh, how do you say it? I would say chamfer. Chamfer, OK. Yeah. That, then that's but what I'm we're going I'm not sophisticated. No, I, I don't know. Between the chamfer, between the vase and the vase, yeah. 
I think from Lowell we would say, we chamfered the vase, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's about it. All right, but we're not in Lowell anymore. So anyway, there are so many aspects of furniture making where you do employ a chamfer to lighten, you can lighten the look of a square piece. Um, you've seen, if you've been around, we undercut bevel tops of tables to lighten up the appearance of the edge. We have make little chamfers on the tops of legs for craftsmen uh, chairs and things like that to make these little pyramids. And it's a fun little detail and there's something about that faceted surface that's kind of intriguing or it, it's an eye catcher and it's enjoyable to look at. I mean, can't, you can't take your eyes off of this, can you? <laughs> it's hard. It is a hard thing. <laughs> Everyone's going to fight over this coaster, right? <laughs> I mean, that is a large coaster, but hey, whatever. So anyway, I was, I, I just decided not to talk about all kinds of chamfers and just talk about this one element of making a stop sign, basically, <laughs> out of wood. So some of you may have seen, I did a video some, probably a couple years ago or more, um, 2016. When? 2016. 20, wow, okay, that was a couple. Yeah. That was five what years ago. Couple? Yeah, that was back when I was, uh, I did this video on making an octagonal post out of, out of a square. And it was, be, it was due to this trick, some of you may have seen it, where I would lay the blade over on the table saw at 45 degrees, and then you bring, you put your square post, lay it right against that blade and then bring the fence up till it just touches the corner then you lock in your fence then you can lay your piece down square on the table and it'll clip all four corners and give you a perfect octagon so i began to think and if you don't know what i'm talking about you like to see that it's a very short edited video and we have a link to it in the notes correct correct in the description below she's she's on top of everything you won't believe it the amount of work she does videotaping last night for two and a half hours until 10.30. <laughs> I'm afraid you have the harder job, my friend. I, I don't know. But the, um, so I'm going to show you a similar intuitive technique on the flat, on the horizontal, to turn a square piece. Now, this isn't square yet, but I'm about to make it square. We're going to make this square, and then we're going to turn that square piece into an octagon with a nice technique at the table saw without any math. All right, so get ready. It's so exciting. All right, so and before we do this, I, I just want to point out that I already squared one corner so we wouldn't have to mess with the crosscut sled. But you can see this is a rough end. And like so many pieces of wood, you, we've got these checks coming in here. Can you see that? See these little cracks? This is where the wood, when it dries, sometimes it dries too rapidly on the end grain. It's very common. Uh, that's why they will coat the end grain of logs before they, um, they, right after they cut them, so that the moisture doesn't evaporate or come out too fast out of the end grain, where it will dry much faster. If it dries too fast here, and it's not dry here, this will shrink and it will have to crack in order to shrink across a wider width. And those are called checks. And you got to look for that when you're buying lumber or when you're starting, you're cutting out a piece. So we're going to dimension this so it's an eight by eight square, roughly, uh, so that we miss the checks. I think that'll get us to miss the check. And yes, we'll be just inside there. And so we've got this corner, and this, this dimension is still a little long. We're at 8 and 3 eighths across this way. Excuse me. So there we go. We've got our square, and we're going to create an 8 by 8. Now, after this, is, this octagon, after we cut all this, I'm going to show you how to clean up all these surfaces with a hand plane pretty quickly. But one of the aspects that's a little more challenging, once you've planed it, uh, once you've shaped it, is to plane the top because 
if you haven't done that already, now you've got these roundish corners. If you go to clean this, it's going to want to spin. So I'm going to just skim plane the top first. Then we're going to square it up. And we won't have to worry about that later because I still have sander marks on there. Now, I just took the thickness that was given to me from the board. All right? This is a nice project, actually, it dawned on me, to use your scrap pieces for. So of the, uh, some of the chest of drawers I made, I had these extra little cutoffs from the ends. And some of them were pretty, pretty wide. And, but there were these short pieces that aren't much good for a lot of things. Um, usually, you see people maybe making cutting boards out of that kind of stuff. Or they just get cluttered up, and you save them for 30 years in a pile, like, <laughs> like I have some over there. But uh, this one, I just took and I dressed it down. It was four-quarter sock, which means in the rough, it could be as much as an inch and an eighth. That's the good four quarter. After it's dry, it actually dries down to a full inch and an eighth. And this, that's what this was. So after thicknessing, I got it down to an inch. So we're working with a nice full inch thick. And that gives you a kind of an appealing, attractive trivet there. Gives you a longer surface to make your facet cuts. All right. So let's go ahead and give this a little skim plane. Now, normally... I like to make sure the plane is tuned, and I maybe even practice a little before I show you like this, but uh, I did not. So I hope the plane is tuned. And the vise is not oiled, clearly. <laughs> but here we go. Um, just going to skim across here. I've got a little bench stop in there. Oh, yeah, see, I've got a snipe down here. Actually, that's beyond the check, or that'll get cut off. So I'm just taking very little off here. This is a nice little, this is almost like a polishing plane here. I'll set it a little heavier. There we go. Still, there's still gossamer shavings. That's what we go for. Email for sure. What's that? Gossamer shavings. Gossamer. Yeah. My gossamer. All right, so there you go. So look, this is pretty clear evidence of a snipe. Can you see that shadowy? That. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that's where the board went through the planer, and or sand drum sander can happen as well. And it's a little lower there because the pressure changed with the pressure rollers, and it takes a little bite or snipe out of the end. That's why I like to hand plane most sur surfaces, but this area will not be part of it anyway. So we're good to go. Now we've got the top. Oh, you know what? Let's be real nerdy about it and hit the bottom while we're here. Not that anybody's going to care, but this way we'll have no machine marks on our finished product. Yeah, baby. That's looking good. All right. Okay, I can still see a light pencil mark. I was like, okay, which corner was square again? <laughs> okay, it's this one here. I'll do that so we remember. All right. There we go. Okay, so let's head over to the table saw, and we will be into our octagon pursuit. Let's all the round tables, round yeah. tabletops. Yeah, we had. Various. I still got stages. one more to, that's in the bag. So we've got beautiful sunburst table tops everywhere. But I got to get ready for the, the modern writing desk. So I think I'll save those for about 10 years or so before I finish them. <laughs> Just kidding. So anyway. Um, Sorry, my nose is really itchy. I gotta just grab a tissue. Excuse me. Okay, I'll let you tend to that. Okay, there we go. All right, so we're gonna cut this into a square. I'm just gonna move my fence over to 
8. We'll go right to 8 here. And lock it in. And I'm going to use this as my pusher. I'm going to wet that so that with that special liquid so I can give it a good push. All right. And I got to keep it tight to the fence. And I'm going to get a cross cut here. I've got my splitter out that end. I'm, I'm focused on keeping that just flat on the fence. As long as it stays flat on the fence, there's, it's going to perform beautifully, okay? So we'll go one cut this way, and then we'll spin, we'll do the second cut the other way. Okay, turn on the dust collector. Here we go. Okay, that was the easy part. It's all easy, actually. So now we are going to, let's see. Yeah, I'll substitute this one, this plate. We're going to need later. I have to put in that wider plate so I can lay the blade over later. And we'll just go with that for now. But I'm going to bring up the crosscut sled as we go octagonally crazy here. Um, somebody asked me that recently and I sent them an answer. It's uh, called Micro Jig. Um, and I believe that's the, it's, it's just, it's nice. They send them and you can plug them in there. Mine is uh, one of the original styles, and I went on their website just the other night and discovered that they now have other models. Mine is a hard plastic model, and the little pins that mount it in there can break off. And so they do have steel models now, so that'll be my next one <laughs> anyway. But yeah, check that out. It's good for the, the 66. All right. So here we go. We want to make this into this with a few simple table saw techniques. Okay? Piece of cake. Now, if you look at this, we've got the grain running like this. And one thing I meant to mention earlier, but I'll mention it now, um, is you want to decide which you want to be your top and bottom. Now, you can see I've talked a lot in the past about types of grain and which ones are more stable and tend to stay more flat. The quarter song grain is the most stable and stays quite flat. It's um, the more linear when the growth rings, if you look right in here, these growth rings are coming at an angle to the surface. Those are considered rift sawn. If we kept going out on the log, eventually you get to a position on the log where the growth rings are perpendicular to the board. And that makes a very stable board. So it's going to stay very flat. And then in the middle here, the growth rings are running parallel with the, the board. And that's called plain sawn. It's in plane with the growth rings, or just dead tangent to the growth rings. That's where it's actually the wood is expanding and contracting the most there, because it expands and contracts the most along the length of the growth growth rings. And also it's the most unstable because if it, does, if it wasn't dried properly and it's not fully dry and you put it in a warm house, the board is going to shrink along those growth rings. So if you imagine this being not a nice kiln dried piece like it is, but 
if it was full of moisture and it shrank, it started to draw up, it pulls along those growth rings. So the growth rings are in kind of a U shape here. And what would happen is, as those tighten up, almost like rubber bands, it would deform the surface of this. The bottom would, would turn into an arc like that. The top will be this way. Okay? You can almost tell every time you pick up a board, if it's, if it's cupped or like on one side, you're going to be able to see that it's cupped opposite the curvature of the growth rings because of the way they pull as it dries. Now this is not going to probably move at all because it's a nice um, kiln dried piece, but it might a little bit. So I'm, I always like to put it this way with the heart side up, the heart meaning the center of the tree facing up, because if it does shrink a little bit and it does pull, it will actually pull so the edges go down to the table and it'll still be stable on there. If you put it the other way, it's going to pull the other way and it's going to want to rock a little bit. Okay, So keep your growth rings up. And I also like the heart side because you tend to get the richer color with cherry because you're more away from the sapwood. All right? Okay, so just confirm that's cherry. Yeah, this is cherry. They're both cherry. All right, so um, this is nice and square. This is going to be my face side. Now, I've already established four of my sides of my octagon. So I've got, this will be one flat. So if we put it right here like this, we've already got, whoops. Oh, there's a little dent. That's kind of a bummer. <laughs> have to sweat that out. <laughs> All right, so... This is two, two sides, and then we've got our top and bottom facet, too. So we basically want to cut these corners off at a 45-degree angle so that their length is exactly the same as what's remaining on our already straightened sides. So there, if you think about it, you could just make a center pivot point on here if we just found this dead center and set a pin in there or a dowel and we were able to set it on the pin and make our square cuts by taking it off the pin and resting it like against a straight fence here and then making a cross cut we would get a nice square using it on the pin then we could spin it to and put a 45 degree fence here it's still on that center axis, okay? So if you turned it, then you'd be dead on that center axis and you could make all the corner cuts to your heart's content, right? But that only works with, uh, that gives you one kind of size trivet. So you'll have to move your pin all the time, move your fence in and out and all that. It's more of a hassle. You have to think too much. I'm gonna show you a way the, my favorite way of working. You don't have to think a lot. <laughs> Actually, I thought a lot about this. Um, but this is, what I want to show you is the way we'll get that point. But I want you to think about that. If you can find a way for it to pivot on that center point and clip these corners, you'll have it. Okay, that's what led to this kind of method. So, <laughs> for this method, we're going to find the center of one of our long sides and for that I'm going to just use the square I think that should be close I just set the square to four that's pretty close all right so I'll set it right to the middle of those that wider line there okay now, here's where it gets fun. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this down and that is my center point right there. So if I, that's like half my distance here. So if I was, if you think about it this way, if I was to make my 
my full square cut, like let's say I, I made one cut like that, and then I rotated my whole width of my piece is out over here. Okay, so that's my full width. If I could rotate on the center axis, it would be halfway between here and here. You know, from my square, if you just think about your square. So that would actually be those lines we just put, okay? So if we came up here and we set it again, just touching the saw blade and made a little mark here, this would be the center point of our, where we want to spin this piece. Now, we don't even need to mark that. I just wanted to show you that so it makes sense. Because I, when I first discovered this, I was like, why does this work? I had to stop and think about it. And anyway, so if we set the fence, just, just bring this up so that that tooth is cutting on the waist side or the half line. Okay, so it looks like right there. And I'm right, if you look, I'm right on the mark on this side, okay? So by setting it there, this is actually the center line that we want to rotate against, okay? So we've got our center point. Now, if we just now bring in a 45 degree angle, or we could, we could use, if you wanted to, we could use one of these 45 degree drafting triangles, and that could come up. And what I'm going to do is just roll it onto the, the bevel, okay? But I'm going to use my fence because I want to lock this in. Just, you can just make a 45 degree cut that you can trust, maybe with a chop saw or another auxiliary sled on your table saw, whatever. So look, I'm just holding it right in that position so that blade is cutting right on the center with the full, the full half on this side. <coughs> can you hear that? I guess you can. <laughs> All right, I'll wait for it stops. Okay, so now I'm gonna slide the 45 right up to it and I'm gonna lock it in, okay? We're gonna screw that right down to the table. I don't want to move on us. So, now, watch what happens. I'm going to just pivot. This is leaning against my square, which is actually the center point, my triangle right there. I'm just going to roll it like this. Okay? Now what happened is, let's go back so you can see what, I'm going to draw this line out so you can really see what's happening. If I continue this, I just put my square down here, this is my center line, if I could do the rotating method. You don't need to do the rotating method if you do this, and it works with any square, because all you do is find the center of, of the, your established square that you want to make an octagon, find the center, set it right there, set your 45, and roll it like that. And look at what happens. The point comes right out to the line, your center line. So what's, what we were in position now for is that center axis is right here in the middle. So if I can just hold this piece right here with a stop there, I can clip the corner. And if I just rotate like this, just resting that down there every time, I will have clipped the corners and every one of these facets will be the same length. No formulas, no pivot point, no nothing. Just a 45 degree wedge. And we're also going to use, to make this cut, we're going to be a little safer here. We've got to have, we have to have a support wedge over here because after we cut them, uh, let's see, when you get to the last one, you have no more point down here to reference from. You've sawn it off. So you've got to have a flat right here. So what we're going to do is just bring this up as our flat support. Let me see here. Huh, that's interesting. 
There's going to be a run on octagonal trivets in the world. <laughs> these are like... These, man, this, if you could bang these out. It would be awesome. Just make a bunch of squares. And then I like to pin nail this to the table. These come out easily, as you've already seen. And you don't want to do it like right where you're going to cut. That little gun is like our I'll do an extra. There we go. Okay. So now we're there, and that'll get cut off with our first cut. And then we'll get, it also is going to back up our cut a little. But I want to, once I've cut that, I want to hold this like a little more, I feel a little unsure how to hold this with your hand because it's, it's awkward. So I'm going to throw in another toggle clamp. Come to love these little toggle clamps. And you could do this. This is, you'll find this makes it a lot more comfortable process. I'm just going to throw this in here. Hopefully this is set with the right pressure. But it'll help to for it not to move. Now, once you've, if you've got a bunch of squares made, you could just set this up and you're good to go. It's great because you can rotate it no problem. If you do the center pin thing, it's a hassle because you've got to lift it up and move it and get your fences all changed. This is nothing. All right? So it's a little weak because I planed it. I had it set right. Let me just adjust that a touch. That up. Just gonna just want it to snug. That feels better. Okay, that gives me a little reassurance. All right, so now we're going to cross cut. Bring the blade up a little bit. Get through there, and I'll turn this on, and I will just bring it back, and I'll rotate, and go through all four cuts. Here we go. We'll start with the one we started with there. And I'll turn on the dust. All right, huh? How about that? Now let's just measure. It should be pretty darn close. Measure this one. No, don't do, get too close so I can say it's perfect. I'm three I'm, not and a, I'm three and a quarter, and I'm three and five sixteenths. So slightly off, but I think it's because I, my point is a little dull there. But you're never going to notice. I can just plane a little more off that corner but it's very slightly off the octagon so my wedge is a little bit um, uncertain there so anyway it's an octagon and now we've got our octagon and we now want to chamfer the edge like that right now I first did it and I set the blade at 45 degrees to cut that chamfer and it, it was too steep so I wanted a, like a longer one. So I actually laid it over to just 30 degrees to get the, this one. 
and I've got a half inch about on the bottom. Okay, if you wanted to copy this, this exact look to give you that nice long chamfer and the lower profile around the edge, that's a half inch. It's overall an inch thick and we've got a 30 degree angle there. So let's set up to do that and then we can clean it up and we'll have two trivets. All right, let's get this back. For this, I'm going to use good old faithful, our tenoning sled jig. And my thickness here is three quarters of an inch. So that's going to be on my fence. So that adds a little to my, that changes my setting over here. So I've got to add three quarters to it to get the proper setting. So I want to have a half inch base plus the three quarter here. So I'll go over to inch and a quarter, get this set up. That's good. All right, now I've got to lay that over to my 30 degrees. And I'm just, I'm not, it's not super critical. It's perfect. So I'm going to put it where I had where my mark is for 30, right there. Okay, there we go. And now, I'm gonna make sure I do the top I wanted to. Here's my heart side, so that's gonna be up. And I'm gonna bring it in like this. Now, I gotta lower that blade. It looks scary up there, doesn't it? I don't wanna be scared. Okay, and because it's octagonal, every time it bumps against my little backer, I've got a flat surface on the, on the table and a flat surface against my fence here. But I don't want to just hold this with my fingers. I'm going to use a couple quick grip clamps. So I'll get it against there, throw a quick grip there, and a quick grip there. Now it's a thing of beauty. All right, so I'm going to turn on the saw, go through this process, and we'll have our beveled edges. Just like that. Here we go.
All right. Easy as pie, huh? Look at that. It looks pretty sweet. I'm going to head back to the bench and I'm going to clean this up. All right, so we're fresh off the saw. So we've got saw marks all around the edges and all around the facets. So those are kind of rough. And to just try to sand that, you'll have a hard time maintaining the facet if you try to sand that off. It's, it's just too, too challenging to do that. I suppose you could set up a sander with a certain angle, but it's too much of a hassle. This is a great way to knock it off with a, a plane. Now, this is also a really nice opportunity to get to understand better grain direction and planing with the grain. If you look here, the grain is running linearly this way. So when we plane um, these edges, we're planing beautifully with the grain. Okay, so that should be pretty comfortable. It, it looks pretty straight, so it probably doesn't matter too much which direction you go there. But then when we plane these surfaces, it's running out at, in this way here. So the grain is exiting at this angle. So if we plane this way, we'd be planing into the teeth of the grain. So you want to always plane with the grain so you're not going into those fibers. See, they're leaning toward this direction. So you want to plane from behind where they're leaning. So I'd also plane this direction here. And then this is end grain. So I'll come across, um, we may not have to worry about tear out, but because it's beveled and it may not tear, but I probably will still just come in from the end, both ends, so we don't get any kind of splintering. And this is end grain here. And so I'm going to plane this with a skewing cut. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll get our edges first. I got my, my little low Lee Nielsen. Somebody might ask about this. This is a, the 60 and 1 half Lee Nielsen block plane. Really sweet plane. Okay, that felt a little rough, so it did matter. Even though it's running straight, there's one way that it's going a little more Oh yeah, you hear the difference? That's nice. So we'll just flip and we'll get the other side well. This should be the... Nice. Now we want to plane this. We, if we plane this way, we'll be going into the grain. So we want to rotate. So we're sneaking up on the grain right here. Look how, look how beautiful that color is. So nice. Just like that, it's clean. And then this would be into the grain, so we'll keep rolling until we get opposite the one we just did. I mean, I gotta get some oil in there, huh? There we go. Now we've got the other angle, so we'll turn it around. That's it, three strokes, good to go. Whoop, there we are, perfect. That gives you a really sweet, crisp facet. Now the end grain on both sides. Here, now, I guess I'll, if you go off, because it's at an angle, the fibers aren't vertical and as fragile. So you can probably plane right off the end. I'm gonna shear and skew it. Yeah, it's okay. Never quite confident about that though. But look at that. That's end grain. And look how beautifully cleaned up that is. So that just take a little bit of light sanding. And we're going to go to the opposite one. And we're maintaining the beautiful crispness of our facets here. Man, that's good. Pleasure. I did just tune up that blade. That's end grain right there. And it's just coming off like nothing. All right, so now we want to hit the, the, the bevels and we will have a completely pla hand planed 
trivet. So I'm going to bring up the little hold fast here. And let's knock that in. This is going to be a little loud. So we can, we want to play in with the grain here. So I'm going to hold it at a little angle. See the saw marks there? Three passes and it's glass. Actually two passes, but yeah, that's glassy too. All right, so let's hit the end grain now. I'm going to skew it, so I'm kind of planing a little bit downhill. Even though it's end grain, it is just like butter. Beautiful. All right, so let's hit this. Well, let me try this edge. All right, I can, as I'm starting, I can feel a resistance that's stronger. So I feel like I'm tearing into the grain a little. I'm going to turn, come at it from the other side. I'm doing a little dance here with the camera lady. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come here All right. and slope down. Oh, I don't know if the camera shakes. <laughs> that adds a dynamic to it. Okay, there we go. And now... I'm not sure it's a very pleasant dynamic if you're watching. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to rotate and we'll get the other four in the same manner. It looks so clear, it's gorgeous. Or gorgeous, 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 as my mother would say. All right. Tom, Mike's asking, or Matt, excuse me, do you put a back bevel on your block plane when sharpening? A back bevel? What do you mean? Um, you mean a micro bevel? I don't put a micro bevel. I just hone this. Um, I do. You do need to hone both the back and the face. So when I'm honing, I do, yeah, I, I, if you're ac asking if I slightly raise it, yes, I do. Just a tiny bit, like the thickness of, of um, a very thin rule you can use to hit the flap back. And that way you really polish it right out to the edge and you get that kind of performance. It's, Usually, I, I don't like to do much on a block plane because it's at a low angle. So you barely want to do that. But um, I do find it gives you just a pure edge when you do that. Yeah, he said micro bevel is what he means. Oh, micro bevel. Okay, so um, I, I do not on this. I just, I, ha I ground it and then I honed it to... I think I was, I was at about 25, maybe a little steeper than 25 degrees on this. So you've got the combination of the bed angle, which is 12 and a half, plus, let's say I was at 30 even, but I think I'm between 25 and 30. Then you're adding, you're bringing that up. If it was 30, you'd be at 42 and a half relative angle of the blade. And, but I'm between 40 and 40. Five, I guess you'd say. All right, here we go. Right across. Oh man, this, there's something really pleasant about that. So we've turned this, we have turned this ordinary chunk of cherry into a sparkling jewel. Those edges are so pure and really sharp right now. We don't want to leave them that way, okay? But isn't that sweet? The way it catches light in the room, everyone will be like, where did you get that trivet? Like, hey, it's just knocked out about everyone. 12 of them. <laughs> everyone, yeah. <laughs> or actually, when it's in the museum, people are going to say, wow, that's really something special. All right, so then we will just very lightly sand it. We've got a little time here. Um, Whoops. I almost would want to hit this with 320 because it's so nice, but I feel a little rippling from that first planing on the top. So I'm going to just lightly, this is lightly card scrape. I'm just taking the slight ripples that you can't see them, but there was a little bit of a line raised there 
on my first plane. Now I'm going to just get my stop up here, and that'll make it easier. So just bump it right against the stop. And this is beat down 220, because I don't have any 320 at the moment. But here we go. Just going to, oh yeah, that's silky. OK, then we can just touch these facets. And what you're standing for all the time is to see clear. So if there was raggedness to the surface, you'd be seeing haziness where the, the dust would settle in the low points of the, the roughness. But there is no, there, <laughs> there are no pits in this. So it's very quick to see it get to a really sweet sanding. You could do it right off the tool, just say, hey, I'm not even going to sand that, but I just find it's, it's, it actually takes and looks better with the finish if you just take that down. Okay, and the edges, I'll just do it while I'm holding it. Just want to keep it flat on there. It's hardly, they're already so clear that plane had no nicks in it, so it's just a really pure, smooth surface. Now we're into the end grain. It feels like a polished gem. And the last side. Now, the edge is a kind of sharp still, so what I like to do when I have facets like that is very lightly break them. It's not like a 90 degree corner where you need much pressure because it's, it's an oblique corner. That's almost back to back weeks I've used the word oblique. Yeah, this just went it's off. It's too bright. Oh, too okay, bright, it just so went off. Good. Okay, so I'm just, just lightly break all these corners, you know, so that that's nice. So your hand, if you, you pick it up, it doesn't feel really sharp. Because right off the plane, it does feel edgy. That's what my father used to say when you get, start getting angry. I'm getting a little edgy. <laughs> you never heard that one, did you? I don't think I did ever hear that. By the time I'd met him, it was pretty... He, he had softened in those softened. years. Yeah. But he used to get edgy. When you're raising seven children, I would imagine edgy is, is a sweet sound. I don't know if anyone else had that car, but that, that one, that was... He'd also hit the back of his hand under his chin and say, I've had it up to here. <laughs> That's because there were seven of us kids, and, you know, it got a little rough now and then. Okay, um, Dennis is asking, why did you use sandpaper after planing the surface is smooth? Couldn't you just have used sandpaper and forgone the planing? Couldn't I just have used sandpaper? And not done the, the planing. Oh, who was that? Dennis, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the planing is made, I was able to maintain the beauty and crispness of my surfaces by planing. It, it is achieve that. And the other great thing it achieves is, did you see the speed, how fast I removed all of the, the um, table saw marks? If you tried to sand those off, especially on end grain, you'd be there a long time and you'd be rounding over these surfaces. Okay, so the plane gives you speed, accuracy, and it saves you tremendous time sanding. I'm barely sanding. I'm bare, I've got like 220 I could have actually had 320 in my hand here. If I had it, I would. And now I'm just very lightly giving it that final detail so it's nice to the hand. I'm just going to go around the bottom just a little so that when you pick it up, it doesn't feel sharp on that bottom edge. And I think this trivet should probably have some kind of little feet under it. 
like you get those little round cork feet, maybe four of them on there, and it would sit on the table beautifully. All right, so hey, we got a, we got a few minutes. I'm gonna splash some Danish oil on there, and we will have taken this from start to finish. Literally. I'm just gonna put, don't get I, mad I anybody, I don't have a glove. My mom used to do decoupage, this is years ago. And some of the things that she would do, the, uh, the, the wooden, <laughs> I don't know what the word is, backing that she would use looked like these kinds of shapes. Oh yeah, yeah, it was faceted mm -hmm. when she would pre-buy them. Did she ever say, I had it up to here? I had it up to here? No, I don't remember <laughs> ever saying I had it up to here. Oh, I'm getting a little edgy. No? No. OK, so I know I don't have gloves on. She had other ways of expressing it. I'm not going to get any on my fingers. Don't anybody worry. All mothers do. All right, so look at this, Cherry. As that starts to soak in there. Oh, that's a thing of beauty. Look at that beautiful color. Mm. That Danish oil will soak in nicely. I'd probably put a couple coats and, or I could just go with water locks from the beginning, you know, and get a little seal. I will, I will finish up with water locks because it's, it's more durable against moisture. You're getting the question about why your can is crushed. Oh. Richard and Dennis are asking. Well, that's to squeeze the oxygen out of the can. If you still have liquid in there and you don't want to pour it in another vessel, oxygen in the can prematurely cures the finish. You know, you go to open it and it's all uh, thick and won't flow and it's, it's pretty much gone bad. Well, that's because it's oxidized. So if you can minimize the amount of oxygen that gets to it, and keep it in a cool, dry place in a cupboard, it will stay fresh longer. So a lot of times I will move the finish, especially water locks, because it's kind of pricey, immediately to um, like four ounce canning jars. They're fairly inexpensive. So you could take a quart of water locks, which is water locks, which is about $35 you know, for a quart. And by putting in those sub jars, you, you've ensured that it's gonna last a lot longer. Let's throw a little on the bottom, why not? Just pour a little. Yeah, so uh, Tom's mentioning this is a great idea for those scrap pieces that everybody has lying around and saying, I'll do something with that later. Yeah, exactly. You don't know beauty. anything about that around here, Tom. No, none of that. Yeah, that's what you got to do. And this is a nice full inch. If you can use the thicker stuff, it does give you a really nice, um, you can get that longer bevel. Gives you kind of a presentation. This reminds me, I made, uh, I made a base for my son's uh, science project one year. We made a, uh, a model of, I think it was Mars or the moon. So we had the styrofoam ball we covered with what was it? Uh, some kind of wood dough. I forget that stuff. But then we made little craters on it and whatever. And put it on a stick. Painted it black or gray. And then I built a base like that. It was a little taller, a little smaller. And put the stick. And that, that was awesome. It looked like a custom made globe. And it, I just knocked it out just like this. But I actually didn't have that method of the triangle like I just showed you because that's that's a new one. All right, so I'll let that soak in for a little while and then I'll come back and wipe off the excess and let that cure and I'll put it on another coat tomorrow. So Tom Anthony's asking, I, he's saying, I thought planing the end grain first was the way to do things, but you did it last. Was What's the reason for that? Um, no reason. Uh, first before we made it into an octagon. Um, I don't know. Just... I think what, oh, what you're saying is because if you plane end grain first, 
It really doesn't matter to me. You just don't want to get tear out on the edges. But if you do get tear out on the edges, you still can plane the long edges and plane that off. That's the only reason that would mean anything. The order really isn't important with a trivet like this. You're just getting every surface to remove the, um, the saw mark. So no, no big deal in the order on a project like this. And most projects. I'm just maintaining, making sure I don't get tear out on the edges when we go there. Uh, what would be the purpose of doing water locks over Danish oil rather than all water locks? All water locks is fine. It's just, yeah, there's no, what, um, I like to use the satin water locks for the last coat. And so I have a can of satin here, usually all the time, but the original, which is a medium sheen, it's a brighter, shinier sheen, it, you should build your undercoats with, with a clearer uh, varnish or oil varnish like this. Because if you build all your coats out of the satin, it gets like this haziness to it. It doesn't look as good. You just put on the satin your last one or two thin coats. So I don't have any original sheen right now. And you can build your undercoats with Danish oil, which is actually less expensive than the water locks if you want to. But you've got to make sure you allow that last coat of Danish oil to fully cure, which is at least 24 hours in good drying conditions uh, before you put on the top coat of, my preference, the satin water locks. And just one or two coats of that would do fine. But yes, you can use all water locks, but you want clear, you could use just the original all the way if you wanted a little shinier appearance at the end. But, and this will darken up nicely and get to a rich kind of color and make a beautiful little presentation. That would be a sweet gift. It sure does. Um, Any other questions? Your light's still off. Do you want it's to know? okay. Oh, okay. okay. Um, can you sh use shellac under water locks, Brian's asking? Brian, yes, you can. Um, but you want to go with the wax-free shellac so that you don't have any adhesion issues. So um, you can buy the seal coat, which is the premix by Zinzer, or you can buy your own flakes and mix your own. You'll know it's good and fresh. And I usually get that stuff from um, wood finishing enterprises. Just make sure that it's one of the wax-free versions. Um, it does come, they have it in all different colors. Like you can get orange shellac that's wax free or you can just, um, you can get the lighter blonde shellac that's also wax free. Really nice stuff. Dean's asking if you change the angle of the wedge could you get different number of sides? Dean, man, it's never enough. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, Stretching, yeah. Yes, Dean, I, that absolutely. Uh, I haven't even thought that's bending my mind a little bit there. But um, I think you would go. You'd go from an octagon like this, and then you could do. You could. You could work on a 16 edge with another wedge. But you know what? That's bending my mind a little right now. So yeah, you'd have to have another second wedge in here. But it'd be 22 and a half, I believe. You need a 22 and a half degree wedge down there. So you'd then cut all those corners a little bit. So yeah, you could do it. So you'd go right from 8 to 16. But if you wanted odd numbers and stuff, man, now you're, you'd have to divide that number of sides um, by the number of sides goes into 360 to figure out your angle. Good question. Yeah, you can make more. There's your assignment, Dean. Dean, that's your homework. Craig's asking, uh, he's saying silk coat is getting tough to find. Do you know why? Or do oh, you know why? I'm not sure. Uh, it could be because of there was a shortage in alcohol, like that kind of, there, everybody was using it for disinfecting, you know, for the virus. Uh, alcohol was in a lot of those sprays to kill germs on contact. So. I think that a lot of companies were making that, and they might have switched over to that for a little while. But, um, but you know, the amount you use of it, if you just wanted some fresh stuff around, 
get the flakes. It's a little more money, but it performs really nicely because it's so fresh. When you, when you mix it yourself, you're good to go. Did you mention stop loss bit bags, or is that someone in here who mentioned that? Uh, no, someone might have met. There's a conversation mentioned. going on here. Yeah. Do you get, have used those, Tom, and where would you get them? I've used, I don't, I don't have any of those, and um, I've used them in the past, but um, I just don't like the bags because it, they end up, if someone likes them, use them. It didn't work for me because the bags end up getting dried out material in them eventually, and they were difficult to reuse if you wanted. If you want to reuse the glass, it's pretty easy. Once it's done, you can just take some thinner and clean it out and use it again. So you're not throwing away those bags. And those bags aren't, they're, they're really good because most of them are squeezable, so you can squeeze the bag until there's no oxygen in it. So that works pretty nice, actually. But it's all kind of what you prefer. What you like. Yeah. Okay, I think that's the last of the questions. All right. Well, I hope you had a good time tonight. I sure did. Just making some simple trivets. And it's as you saw how fast that went, you could knock out a whole bunch of these easily on a Saturday, have them finished by lunchtime. Well, maybe, maybe a little <laughs> later. But once your plane's tuned up and you're ready to rock, you could really knock something like this out. So if you enjoy this content, consider subscribing and become part of us here. If you really want to get closer to what we're doing, go to the website at epicwoodworking.com. You can see all the courses we have available there that take you through projects really in an in-depth experience. And you can see the new courses I mentioned at the beginning tonight that we have coming up next month. The Modern Writing Desk. I can't wait for that one. And then the Shaker Chest of Drawers the next month. And if you missed it and you want to get in on that Contemporary Roundtable, we've got the recorded version now available for you. And each one of those is available with full-size drawings. The modern writing desk drawings are, are being drawn now. So <laughs> those are not quite yet available yet, but will be out very soon. So thank you so much for hanging out with us one more evening here in, in the shop in Canterbury, New Hampshire. On behalf of the camera lady and myself, we've been pleased to have you as our guests. Yes, yes, yes. So we look forward to seeing you next time, next Thursday night, right back here in the shop for Shop Night Live. <laughs> How was that one? <laughs> that was thorough. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night.